What we're going to do today is have a conversation about some of the fiction and nonfiction that Ayn Rand wrote. And we hope that this will help introduce some of her writing to you. We're going to explore some of the themes in Ayn Rand's works and the intriguing material that she covers in those. We're going to connect it to some of her novels for those who've read them and bring to light the ideas and philosophic import in her work. Our purpose is to show the range of Ayn Rand's writings. There's a lot to explore, and we'll touch on some books and perhaps not others. So, let's get started. People know Ayn Rand as a novelist. She wrote four major novels, Anthem, We the Living, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged. But in addition to that, Rand wrote a lot of essays over her career essays that touched on all kinds of issues that were relevant to the culture in her time. Now, her writing was done 30 to 40 years ago, and so often people wonder, is that relevant to what we are facing today? How is it relevant? And why, why be interested in, in somebody's writings when it's about the past? I think a, a key to that is to recognize that Ayn Rand approached a lot of these issues in a way that picked out a timeless element, either a theme or a point that has resonance today and will be illuminating even if the issues and the concrete news that she's commenting on is, no, is now far in the past. But to give an example, even to this day, I often revisit some of her articles, uh, those on the Vietnam War, some of her articles on the Watergate issue and the principles involved there, not the ones most commonly understood. There's really value that lasts despite the, the passage of time in those works. Yes, Watergate, you just mentioned that. She was talking about events that were happening at the time. Now, some of the other events that she discussed that seem like they're from the past, yet have these kinds of timeless elements to them. For instance, she wrote about Berlin and about World War II. And the student rebellions of the 60s, Woodstock. Yes, the hippies. She wrote about the hippies. So there's a segment of her writing that takes current issues from that time period and analyzes them. But the reason that it feels as though there's a timeless element to it is because what Ayn Rand is dealing with are philosophical ideas. And because she's talking about philosophy, the idea behind her analysis is just as true today as it was 30, 40 years ago. And to expand on that, she is a philosopher. She does deal with the strictly philosophical questions too. An example is she looks at the role of duty in morality. A lot of people and a lot of moral theories take duty as central. They put it front and center. On her analysis, the conclusion she reaches is we have to rethink that because duty, properly understood, is destructive. She has a whole analysis in the essay Causality versus Duty. And she presents her own view of what morality should look like. And that's a question of morality. It's applicable in all times, in all places, to all people. Yes, it is. Um, one of the books that we won't have a chance to cover today is called Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Now, epistemology sounds like a very technical, philosophical subject, and it is. It's how one acquires knowledge, how one develops and acquires knowledge. So Ayn Rand actually has her own theory of concepts and how we form them. She actually covers technical philosophical issues as well. The title of this book has always uh, been associated in my memory with a funny story that a friend of mine told me. We were both uh, in London at the time, and Ayn Rand's books are pretty rare over there. And so he was telling a colleague at work about the title of the book, and he was reading it at lunchtime. And the other person he was talking to was dumbfounded because he thought, you mean the virtue of selflessness? That's obvious. Why would anyone write a book about that? And he had to show them and make them read it carefully because the title was The Virtue of Selfishness. And at that point, that was a conversation uh, point because the other person thought, who would write a book like that? That is just, it's got to be a typo. Who would, who would allow a typo on the cover of a book like this? And then that started them into a deep conversation because what Ayn Rand said in the opening pages is, I titled this book very deliberately with the, with the goal of getting people to question their view of this concept. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the virtue of selfishness. I think Ayn Rand actually viewed a lot of things as virtuous that most people wouldn't. So selfishness was one of them. Selfishness is just viewed as one of the most, it's what leads to the 
the you know unraveling of our society when people are selfish and greedy and all those things. But for her, it's a virtue, and so that that title is definitely provocative. But so are the other titles. Right, right. I mean, the one that I remember uh, worrying about carrying it around on campus because if someone really? saw what with this, I mean, <laughs> is capitalism the unknown ideal? It's she says it's unknown, contrary to what people think they know, and that it's an ideal. It's something to aspire to. So both we don't live in it mm -hmm. and it's something we should do. So you open the pages and you realize this is something that is good, mm -hmm. even as you're hearing it denounced everywhere from the Vatican to the White House. Mm -hmm. Now, capitalism is one of those terms that's known. So people hear capitalism and they think they know it. Right. And part of what Ayn Rand lays out is a very different view of capitalism, a full laissez-faire mm. capitalism. And that's just something the world hasn't seen yet. So yeah, another intriguing title. Uh, the next one that I can think of is also pretty intriguing. It's one that I wasn't sure what it was about when I saw it. And that's the Romantic Manifesto. Mm. So I'd heard of the Communist Manifesto, which is the manifesto most people are familiar with. And what was that? That was you know, the plan, um, the communist plan, laying out exactly how communism would work and why it was the right worldview. So here we have Ayn Rand, who's talking about a romantic manifesto. And what does she mean by romantic? Well, it's a book about her view of art and its, its role in life, and also the, the urgent need for putting what she regarded as romantic art, which is a school of art, and that it needed a philosophic basis and that it was uh, falling apart. Mm -hmm. as a, This is a symptom of her view of society. So it's, it's like the Capitalist Manifesto, so the Communist Manifesto was a radical book in changing society. This is a radical book in what art needs as a foundation for its future, if it's to survive and have that positive role in man's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she had a certain view about what art what art was good art and what art was bad art and mm. why and why it was important to care about it what the relationship was to one's life so yeah which is totally anathema if you walk into the Tate Museum or any other museum art having standards if it's on the wall it's art he says no way the next one that is uh, that stands out is for me for the new intellectual new intellectual yeah and if you've been on campus you might wonder why new? I mean, we have lots of intellectuals. Some people say we have too many. Mm -hmm. um, and she had a distinctive view of both their role in society, their importance, mm -hmm. and the fact that the ones we have are not the kind who are really advocating the right ideas and supporting freedom and capitalism. They're undermining it. And this mm -hmm. is part of her view of what's going on in the world. She had a radical view of the role of ideas in shaping society, and therefore the importance of having intellectuals as steering the culture and that their abdication of that responsibility is, is disastrous. So here we have her message to in, the new intellectual, in her view, is somebody who is going to pursue an intellectual career in a certain way, and what that means and what its implications are, mm -hmm. and how one actually can see ideas actually change the world, as opposed to talking about ideas change mm -hmm. the world. So yeah. she's got her message for the people who are going to do that, the new intellectuals. And and yes, she has some comments on, on the, the current intellectual state of her time. So another, another interesting title. And then we have one about the new left. The subtitle is really where the, that's the striking point. She said, the new left, the anti-industrial revolution. And if people remember their history, the industrial revolution was a momentous period mm -hmm. in human civilization of bringing enormous wealth and industry and so forth and revolutionizing the world in every respect. She says the new left, which everyone heralded as this is the, the blossoming of freedom in society, the, the liberation of all mankind. She says, no, these people are going to, uh, their aim is to tear down right. the industrial world and take us back to living in primitive society, primitive nature, actually. Right. So at a time where everybody else in the world was really praising the, the, the stopping, they wanted to stop progress in a number of different ways. Here you have Ayn Rand actually championing progress. And what she does and the way she views industrialization and its role in the world and how it's not just something that happens by magic, it actually requires a lot of effort um, and it requires the best in people to produce. Yet 
and there's this real lack of understanding or appreciation for that whole process and, and how it comes about. So yeah, just understanding the role of industry and the role the role it has in our lives, I think that's something that she made clear in a way no one else did. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to believe, but she, she I think one of the editions had a cover of it, a factory on it. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, oh, factory, boring. What? Mm -hmm. Who could be interested? And then having read the book, I came away thinking, wow, a factory is a monument, advancement of human civilization skyscrapers are just something that symbolize our progress. And there are people in, in this world who want to tear that down. Now, you may not be able to tell this from the title of the collection, but Ayn Rand herself said that this collection she wrote for college students and for people who work with college students, it's for those people who are looking for a voice of reason to turn to. And you can understand that better if you realize that at the time, there were massive student protests and a lot of concern about what's happening to the next generation. She says to understand these upheavals, you have to understand what's happening in the schools, the impact of progressive education as an ideology, and in the university. You have to understand the role of and the impact of ideas from the left, particularly the new left, and how that shapes people's actions and views. Now, Part of the reason she appears to be able to see these issues in a way that nobody else is, is she placed a certain value on philosophy. Mm -hmm. And actually the last of her nonfiction titles that I want to raise at least is one that I thought should have a question mark in it when I first saw it. Philosophy, who needs it? Doesn't have a question mark at the why, end of it. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody actually, whether they explicitly know it or not, operates on and needs to operate on a philosophy, a set of ideas that guide your life. In fact, not doing so would lead to death. That's pretty mm -hmm. dramatic. Mm -hmm. So we think of philosophy as being something that academics do in the university setting. It's it's ivory tower. It's detached. You know, it's about it's about up in the mind. And for for Ayn Rand, her view is that philosophy is what makes the world move. It's what you need to understand in order to live life. It's not about it's not about the floating abstraction, it's about how to actually take action day to day. Yeah, and what's striking is it has both perspectives, it has both the impact of philosophy on a society, on a civilization, a macro level, but then it really speaks, I mean, it spoke to me personally, and, and mm -hmm. not just in my time of life reading it, but it says, you, your life is in your hands, and you need to realize that choices you make have an implication for what you do, and you should be conscious about mm -hmm. that. And that is the role of philosophy. You either have it and choose it, or you put your life out of control and, and abdicate. So that's a nonfiction, but I found that the titles of the fiction to be equally intriguing. Anthem. So what is, the, an anthem is a song or celebrating mm -hmm. some ideal or country typically. What is she singing an anthem to? And it is a, a lyrical book. It's almost like a poem mm -hmm. uh, relative to her other uh, fiction works. Mm -hmm. You read it, and you are, will be surprised to find that it's an anthem to the ego in man's life in a, in a radically new conception of what that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we mentioned uh, the virtue of selfishness, and that is a radical conception of morality based on an individual's life. Here she dramatizes it, and it is... It, it puts it pits the individual and his value, sings the praises of that in contrast to a society that crushes the individual. It's a society where there is no I, there is no pronoun I, there's just we. And what she shows in the book is what happens to an individual when the, the concept I is gone, when there is no way to, there is no individual apart from other individuals what the consequences are to an active-minded person and what happens on, as you said, a macro level to the society at large. So yeah, her anthem is to the meaning and glory of man's ego. Um, that's a very different anthem from the typical one. Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting is just the word on the setting. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of other authors have written books about the future where things go wrong. And in a certain way, anthem is like that. Whereas they portray the future as highly technological and advanced, she says, well, if you crush the individual, all of that goes away, and mm -hmm. it is a surprisingly backward society, and mm -hmm. it logically tied to the theme. So I, it's interesting that she sees the future as backwards when you subtract the individual. And the next book that, that uh, she wrote was We the Living. Mm. Now, We the Living, if you think about it, this is, this is a book that was uh, set in communist Russia. It's about a young engineering student 
who has some aspirations where she, she understands her life to be actually a sacred treasure. Uh, but here she is in a setting where the society around her is doing its best to completely, again, but not in, not in such a futuristic type you know, setting, but in something that really happened in history, communist Russia, to wipe out that individual in favor of the collective. And here's the story of what happens to an individual like Kira in such a setting. Yet the book is called We the Living, not We the Being Crushed. Or, yeah, and yeah. It, 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 I think one of the ways she put it is, here's what happens when these ideals of the communist system, the collectivist outlook and philosophy, when they're realized, and she thought they were realized, what does that do to those who most want to live and succeed in the world? And it's, it's striking that those are the people who suffer most and the ones who rise, mm -hmm. and this is really part of her warning to America, those who rise are the worst among men. Mm -hmm. And that is inherent in a system that crushes individual freedom. So what about the next, what, the next title? Yeah, it, with The Fountainhead, it's The Fountainhead of what? That's a real question in the title, and I think she answers that in, in a fascinating way by showing the role of individualism, not politically so much in the way that We the Living is a political book, but in an individual's own life. In his soul. In his soul. It's a logical dimension to it. She pits two characters who, as they're as different as they could be in terms of one is truly first-handed, mm -hmm. which is her view that you take the world in yourself, and the other is anything but anything but yeah <laughs> yeah i mean the other is somebody who borrows his vision he borrows his ideas he's he he will do whatever it is that he thinks uh he's is, is expected of him so he has no no self-guided um set of actions here and it, this book really shows what it requires to be an individual to be an individual with integrity in a society that just does not value independence or integrity so uh, it's the fountainhead of man's independence and and what it takes for him to create that soul yeah and even you could expand on that and say the the fountainhead of his virtue that the right. means by which he can achieve the values he wants and mm -hmm. his success mm -hmm. and the importance of sticking to your own vision your first-handed vision not letting other people kind of intercede for you mm -hmm. And then the final title is Atlas Shrugged. Isn't, you know, we know from Greek mythology there is a figure of Atlas who is holding up the world. Now, what does it mean to hold up the world? And what happens if Atlas were ever to let go, if he were to actually shrug the world from his shoulders? That's what that novel is about. It really sets in motion a lot of questions for people when they read the book. And mm -hmm. some of those you just indicate who's Atlas? Who's really uh, creating the values in society? Mm -hmm. who's lead who are the heroes? Mm -hmm. And we, in our culture, we have. A very clear view of what heroes are. A lot of people would say someone like Mother Teresa is a hero. Right. Um, you know, and Ayn Rand's vision of what a hero is is the farthest thing from Mother Teresa, and yet it's still different from what people think an individualist, egoist type would be. I mean, she she sings the praises of an industrialist, an inventor, mm -hmm. a, a, a railroad, a uh, composer, a composer, a banker, a philosopher. <laughs> yeah. So she's writing about people that she, uh, that her that are actually accomplishing a fair bit, but in her view, these are what normal people should be like. Mm -hmm. Yet they're anything but normal people. And what would happen if these what we view as atlases? What happens if they shrug? And what would be the reasons for them to do Why that? There's a really that, yeah. there's a real mystery in the story, and I wanted to touch on that because as much as it is a projection of heroes. It isn't a simplistic morality tale in the way that if you've read morality tales, there's stock characters. This is, these are people you'd want to meet. Right. And you, you get enmeshed in their lives and their, their adventures. And it is an exciting book. Mm -hmm. I mean, I recently reread it. Mm -hmm. And I, I could not put it down. And I've read it a few times, mm -hmm. which just says there's something inherently captivating about the storytelling, the suspense, the questions that I know the answer to as having someone who's read it before. But yet... The logic of it pulls mm -hmm. you in, and then the dynamism of these characters and what obstacles they face and how they face up to those. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it leaves you with a positive of what is just a vision of the human spirit mm -hmm. that is you cannot find elsewhere in a in in a story that weaves that into every detail and subplot, and it, it's an experience. I mean, it's not like reading. Uh, there are certain books you read and you toss away; mm -hmm. you won't remember them. This is a book that will alter your view, will make you question things 
about your life, mm -hmm. what's good and bad in life, good, good and evil, and the people around you. And not just raise the questions. I mean, I think this is mm. this is a really important point. Is is if she just raised the questions, I think that would be intriguing. Um, but it's more than intriguing. It's inspiring, and it's something that a lot of people, when they report, I read Atlas Shrugged, and it changed my life in this way or that way. They can explain to you why that mm. is. Uh, so that the novel actually raises questions for them, but Rand through that novel provides answers. She provides her view of what a correct moral code entails. And by presenting that very, what sounds like a very abstract set of ideas, actually shows you how it applies to one's life and how one can take, um, how one can change course if one chooses to. Yeah, I mean, it, the way I remember the experience reading it as a teenager is, it holds up to you a world and what it could be. And it says to you, you could achieve this. Yeah. It's within your, re your means. And this is what a, a good society could look like. And this is, I mean, it's a world you want to live in and help realize. All right, let's take actually a closer look at some of these books. Now, the one we started with, the story with your friend, The Virtue of Selfishness, what's inside the cover of that? Let's, let's look at that. Sure. Uh, because that is an intriguing title, The Virtue of Selfishness. And what Ayn Rand is talking about in that book is her ethics. And we have a series of essays where she lays out what her view of ethics is and how it would work in the world. So one of the interesting starting points for me is the essay, The Ethics of Emergencies. Mm -hmm. Now, we often hear about ethics put in the terms of emergencies. You hear of ethical dilemmas, right? You and I are in a lifeboat. We have food for one of us. Uh, there's no help in sight. Who should get the food, me or you? And how would we decide that? So often we hear about ethics being put in terms of these just uh, very rare situations where we have to choose who should sacrifice, me or you, right? Now, Rand rejected that view of ethics. Now, in the essay, she does answer the question about what one should do in an emergency, but her view is that ethics is not about the emergency situation. Ethics is about how one interacts with other people in day-to-day -day life. Ethics provides a guide to decide what actions to take and not take vis-a-vis -vis other people. So from her point of view, ethics is not about the emergency situation, it's about life. Yes, and it's it's even more than just how to deal with other people. That's definitely mm -hmm. an important part. I think it's it's even more how do you guide your own life, your own uh, individual course in life, and the, the necessary judgment that goes in with that. And I think she's also pushing back on the conventional view, which you've indicated is is wrapped up with with the idea that sacrifice is inevitable. The question is to whom and for what, and is it society, the other person in the lifeboat? And she's saying that is inherently not a guiding philosophy because it's not really practical. And that creates this view of morality as divorced from day-to-day -day life, right. from it, your own values. The only time you think of morality is in an emergency when you're faced suddenly with the question, what should I do? I'm in unfamiliar, you know, I'm in an emergency. Now what do I do? And her view is you don't wait till the emergency to decide how to live, how to approach those questions. Typically, morality, as she says in the essay, collectivized ethics. She terms it that. It's wrapped up in, you know, what does society want of you? What, what is your role? How do you adjust yourself to society? Um, you know, you hear this politically in, will society let the, the hungry go hungry? Mm -hmm. Who will take care of the sick? And she says, you're conceiving of the issue from a collective view. You should think about, well, it's the individual's own life. He's responsible for thinking about how to achieve his end, how to succeed and be happy and accomplish what he wants to do in his life. And that is not wrapped up in any required sacrifices. In fact, she says morality should be free of them. Uh -huh. There is an example that's coming to mind from the fiction. We mentioned the novels that Ayn Rand wrote. Well, in one of the novels, Atlas Shrugged, we actually see this issue of collectivized ethics come up. Um, here's an example that I always found very interesting and, and just explain the issue for me. Uh, there's a industrialist who creates a new metal. It's a new metal that's better, it's stronger, it, it, it can be used in all kinds of new, in new ways. It's revolutionary uh, metal here. And what happens is the question becomes, well, who should control the access and use of that metal? Shouldn't that metal be available to everybody? If it's so good, shouldn't that be available to everyone? So why should 
why should only this industrialist be able to sell that metal? What about the public good and everyone else? Mm -hmm. Now, in this case, we have an industrialist who eventually stands up and says, the public good be damned. Mm -hmm. So it tells you something about Ayn Rand's answer to the question. But it was interesting that in Atlas Shrugged, we see her ethics played out through the story. Yeah, and this collectivized view is pervasive in the culture, not just in ethics. I and mean, you indicated a political example, too, in that uh, of um, Henry Reard and the industrialist. And I think she had a view of collectivism as really on the, on, the, on the rise in America and as having no place in it. And I think the essay Racism really brings that to light. Yeah, it does. So racism, what, what Ayn Rand is analyzing there is what happens when people take the, the you know, physiological characteristics of a person and judge that person by those things that he doesn't control at all, his, his physiology, his genetics, his background. Ayn Rand actually called that, you know, one of the lowest crudest, most primitive forms of collectivism. And uh, she, she rejected any kind of racist uh, type of, of approach to an individual, judging people by that, by that nature. And we see that played out in her, in her fiction, too. Yeah, it's fascinating because one of the, uh, um, it, We the Living, in fact, which is set in Soviet Russia, it, is an example of a society ruled by this idea of collectivism. Mm -hmm. And even though they're not judging people by skin color right. or by um, you know, more obvious uh, things like a tribal thing, uh, identity, they're judging people by unchosen characteristics. Right. And they're, in a sense, being collectivist, a form of uh, that. And it's just as bad. It's horrific. Mm -hmm. you know, the example, I think, is Kira Argunova, who I think she's purged from university or that there's a threat of that kind of thing because of who her parents are or her ancestors, which is, in essence, the same kind of thinking that the Klansmen have about uh, black people being inferior. It's unchosen characteristic, which is a form of collectivism. Right. We see in the novel, we see Kira and the other characters being asked over and over again or being branded over and over again because of what the family and the, uh, the father and the grandfather or the generations prior have done. And that, you know, doesn't matter what Kira has done, doesn't matter what her potential is, what she's capable of. It's a prejudgment based on things that have nothing to do with her own life or success. Yeah, and you could turn it the other way, too. Mm -hmm. In elevating the proletariat, which is the sort of yes. collective, the, the communist version of the proletariat is good because it is the downtrodden. Right. Well, you know, that's a form of judging people by membership in a group. It's not even clear that that's a group, but that's the, the, the view in on the Marxist view. I thought the other interesting essay that really struck me is it starts with a question. A lot mm -hmm. of them, uh, a lot of Ayn Rand's works prompt questions, and I think here she's really offering a fascinating answer. Doesn't life require compromise? Right. You hear that all the time, that life requires compromise. That's how we get along with one another. You give a little, I give a little, and then we, we're all happy and we get to get along together. Marriage requires compromise. Work requires compromise, right? Um, Ayn Rand's view is that she rejected that life requires compromise the way most people mm. describe compromise. Now, she describes that there, there is a legitimate form of, of you know, coming to an agreement on something. And then there is a form of what's called compromise where one person is actually giving up or sacrificing, sacrificing a moral principle. And in that case, she says compromise is not an option. Uh, the other thing that is really striking here is you mentioned that this the subject of the book is ethics. And one thing people, after talking about compromise, will say, well, but there are a lot of cases where we clash, you know, that we have conflicts all over the place. And she addresses that. She does. There's an essay about the conflicts of men's interests and, and whether or not they would really be such conflicts in a rational society. And mm -hmm. Ayn Rand's view is that there would not. If people are actually operating in a rational society, they may have competing competing claims, but that doesn't mean that their their claims are in conflict with one another. Uh, there's an example in the essay that I that helped me understand this point. I say you and I are actually up for a, we're competing for a job. Yeah, Neither I, of us. Have. I get it. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We're competing for okay. it. We'll see. But uh, you know, we're both competing for the job. And let's say you get it. Um, had, is there any conflict between the two of us uh, over this situation? You know, before reading the essay, I would have said obviously. Her answer is, not if you really understand what it means to have a conception of your interests. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there, there's a lot that she sh sheds light on to suggest that people don't understand that 
your interests are not obvious. And this goes to the issue of the title of the book, Selfishness. Selfishness, people think, is the easiest thing to do. You have to just grab at things. Her claim is, no, understanding what is in your self-interest is a long-range conceptual uh, perspective that requires thinking. And it requires bringing a, a large context to your thoughts. So in, in the example of pursuing a job, I feel hard done by. Mm -hmm. But my feeling or my whim, if it is such, is not a guide for what is in my interest. And in fact, the larger context would say, it's better to be in a society where we can compete for a job than in a society like we are living, where you are either handed a job or you have to go and beg for one and pull strings and so forth. So th there's a, a whole context to assessing, am I, have I lost out here? And you can multiply the examples. It's not just in a case of a job. So let's turn to one of the other books and take a look inside the cover there. Capitalism, the unknown ideal. Now, most people think they know what capitalism is. Isn't that what we have now? We have capitalism. It's kind of a you know, something that we hold our nose and go about. It's a it's a one of those evil necessities that allows us to have the standard of living that we do. But capitalism, for most people, has some very negative associations with it. It's you know people who are greedy, blood-sucking, you know, Wall Street types that will cut any corners to get what they want. Now, that's what people typically hold as capitalism. What Ayn Rand's title implies is that perhaps capitalism, that in the way you think you you know it, is, is wrong. Like maybe there is a system, and she lays this out in her book, capitalism, proper capitalism looks different, and it actually is an ideal, not something that we put up with. So, that's the that's what she's covering in this set of essays. Now, when we look, we step back from the book from Capitalism: The Unknown Ideal, and we look at Atlas Shrugged, we see a certain kind of set of characters in there that are worth talking about for a minute. So, a lot of businessmen in Atlas Shrugged, which already makes Atlas Shrugged an unusual book because it's about businessmen and what they do. Now, you have two kinds of people in there. You have Hank Reardon, who we come to see as a hero, and Dagny Taggart, we come to see her as a hero. And what are they doing? They're engaged in a certain kind of productive activity that requires them to take all kinds of actions and all kinds of make all kinds of decisions. What we see them are people who are generating wealth, who are creating values. There's, there's a set of activities that they're engaged in that we associate. That's business. But then there are these other people in the book that are also labeled businessmen, but instantly we can see that what they're doing is very different. Yeah, what are they not, doing? It's not productive activity. The, yeah. the sharp contrast is Henry Reardon is an industrialist in the steel industry. He spends years developing a new kind of metal that's enormously valuable and it takes a lot of thought and investment and, and, and long-range planning. Another One of the competitors in the industry is a man called Oren Boyle, mm -hmm. and he spends years cultivating political relationships. Right. He doesn't, he's not essentially doing productive work. He's mm -hmm. looking for handouts, subsidies, advantages through his political pull. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then there are other characters like him. He's sort of the sharpest example of that. And we see that in real life, too. And this is part of what happens in people's view of capitalism. They see they're businessmen who do both kinds of things. And so they they blame, so, and Oren Boyle is exactly the kind of guy who would cut a corner. In fact, right. <laughs> that does happen. And yeah. he, he's a schemer. He's not concerned with his long range success. So he doesn't value you know, the customers. He doesn't deliver his orders. I mean, that's, right. it, it's to that extent that he's not engaged in business. Mm -hmm. So yet yeah, we see, so in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, in the real world setting, Ayn Rand is describing these two types of people that get lumped together, and they are certainly not of, of equal standing, according to Rand. One of the essays that grabbed my attention, just from the title, was called America's Persecuted Minority, Big Business. Now, in the time period that Ayn Rand is writing, there is a lot of talk about minority groups. There's talk about the blacks, about women's rights. So minority is a term that people have become familiar with. But what Ayn Rand says in this essay is, there is a minority group of big business that is actually attacked and vilified in a way that if these kinds of attacks and vilification were occurring with one of the other minority groups, people would stand up and not tolerate it. Here, in this case, because it's businessmen, we tolerate it. This is the group that actually produces what it takes for us to enjoy our standard of living. We rely on them for a lot of things that we just take for granted day to day. 
for Rand, that persecuted minority is the is the Reardon, it's the Dagny Taggart, it's the people who are actually these, these productive businessmen. Now, there are real life equivalents of those. And she talks about them in an essay in yeah, this book. That's the uh, notes on the history of American free enterprise. Mm -hmm. the, the history actually is unknown, and therefore that's part of what happens to capitalism, reputation and moral standing. And mm -hmm. that's part of what she addresses. Mm -hmm. And in, in America's Persecuted Minority, what Rand is telling, you know, what she is sharing with us is her view that the businessmen that we actually rely on, that we count on, we count on them to keep producing all of these things that we enjoy, right? Yet we persecute them, we vilify them, we attack them. So there's a, she has a very strong defense of that kind of proper businessman, the way, the way she views it. Now, why do people lump together this, this group of really virtuous people with the kind of people that we associated that slimy side of yeah. quote unquote capitalism? Um, so she does another essay in there called The Pull Peddlers. What does she mean by what's, what pull is being peddled and what, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> I think this refers to the, the mechanism in, in a mixed economy. So not a laissez-faire economy, not capitalism, but the kind of society we have today mm -hmm where there is some freedom, but large uh, 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 in, uh, regulation and control and then subsidies and handouts for business in which the pull is political favor and the peddling is done by those in Washington who have access to, well, I can give you a subsidy, I can help you with a tax break, I could do this kind of favor for you. And it's a sort of horse trading and it's seamy, it's ugly and it, it's, it's the sort of thing, so in Atlas Shrugged, this occurs and the archetype uh, practitioners are Oren Boyle and Jim Taggart, yes. uh, who, who's uh, in the story uh, running the railroad. And this is exactly what happens in a society where the government's power extends beyond its proper function. I think mm -hmm. that's a topic we'll touch on, mm -hmm. meaning it's not merely uh, protecting the freedom of individuals to act and, and, and produce, it's actually going into the economy and setting controls and regulations and telling businessmen what to do in ways that are inappropriate and wrong and contrary to the protection of freedom. And that creates the ability for government to play favorites and right. pick winners and losers. And it brings to the surface the worst kinds of businessmen, the R and boil types, and the ones we see today who deservedly have a bad name. But we shouldn't, as she's saying, assume that all businessmen really have this motivation there businessmen who want to produce and excel at it. In fact, we wouldn't be here without them. Right, and the, the mixed economy that we have, as you mentioned, what it does is it brings it brings the, the, the pull peddlers up to the top um, because of the nature of the system. So in Atlas Shrugged, even Hank Reardon, at one point, hires a man in Washington. Because he doesn't want to have to deal yeah. with that, but how are you going to work in this system? How are you going to run a business in this system unless you have a man in Washington? So even a Hank Reardon, has to actually at one point turn attention to how this gaming system works. It's fascinating because it, 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 it even pushes the good people to have to deal with a bad system and it pollutes the whole economy. It's interesting there's a parallel with We the Living here. Yes. Because it's exactly this kind of status system where in, on the Soviet model, it's a total system mm -hmm. and it really does bring out the worst. And it's inherent in having a society where the state has so much power to dispose of people's, not just their wealth and re, so-called redistribute it in our society, in the mixed economy, but in the, in the Soviet system is essentially dispose of your life. Right. And so when that power is put in the hands of government, it brings the ones who want to earn benefits from the state and those are the pull peddlers and the pull traders. Right. So for me, the, the fact that these two essays are in one collection, uh, I find that to be very interesting. Let's not put together America's persecuted minority with the pull peddlers and call them one group of people, businessmen. They're very different, and those two essays help bring out the differences in them. So we, we just talked about one of the important topics that Rand covers in this collection, and that's her view of businessmen and, and her assessment of what a proper businessman is versus the pull peddlers. And that's just one of the topics where she does that kind of, here's the ideal, here's what you think you know, but here's, here's actually a very different way of looking at it that actually yields a, a, a quite a different result. So some of the other topics she covers, and I think it'd be interesting to just quickly hit them so we have a sense of what else is in this collection. First, 
what is capitalism? Isn't the United States a capitalist country? We describe it that way. Most people think of us that way. Yeah, most people think of us that way. Yet, don't we have this very system of subsidies and favors and pull peddling that Rand is discussing? So if that's not capitalism, what is capitalism? And she actually lays that out in detail in terms of what that system would really look like if it was truly that safe fair. What about uh, government? In this essay, she's got an essay on the proper role of government. And so yeah, and that's a an issue that people rarely think about because they take the society we live in as, as normal, as part of nature, has always been this way, and yet the nature, the proper nature of government, is a is an important question that needs to be rethought, and that's part of the thrust of her essay. Is you don't understand exactly what government should be. You're just looking at go the way government is, and the way it is is destructive. It's inimical to freedom. A proper society looks very different. And the other one that comes to mind in this context is rights. Everyone thinks they have rights to this, rights to that, rights to health care, rights to an education. Right to minimum wage, right to a job, right to, yes. You just proliferate them. Mm -hmm. And she says, stop. No, That's this right. is not what a right is. She has a, a specific, precise definition of individual rights, mm -hmm. and that is very uh, unusual for someone to go to that because that's that's the sort of thing that the founding fathers were doing really thinking about that concept she's saying people today don't understand that that it, it's there may be you know a handful of people engaged in this work that do and everybody needs to rethink what they believe about these issues so what Rand says in in the essay man's rights is, yes individuals do have rights so yes rights are a proper concept but only if we define them properly and consistently with man's nature in the context of this political system, capitalism. Right, you have a right to be free to act, but you don't have a right to take and gain goods and so forth. And that re puts a sharp dividing line between the kind of rights we have today and the kinds that a proper government should be mm -hmm. protecting. And just a final example of some of the things that she covers here where her perspective really brings into question the commonly held view. Conservatism. I mean, most people associate conservatives with being the pro-capitalist political And they way. themselves present themselves that way. A lot of them right. believe that they are the champions right. of capitalism. Right. Well, Rand's view is very different. You know, Rand's view, there's an essay in the collection called Conservatism and an Obituary. Now, if we, you know, according to Rand, if you really pursued the conservative agenda, it would be the end of capitalism. So that essay what, what lays that out a little bit more, explains why she thinks conservatives are no defenders of capitalism. Yeah, and in fact, they've been, they've been important and instrumental in bringing down capitalism and expanding the mixed economy, the welfare state, and all of the institutions that we've talked about in terms of the pull peddling and the, the curtailment of freedom. So let's talk about one of the other books that is in that collection that we discussed. And this one sounds like it should be a question, the title of it. But it really isn't a question. It's a statement. And philosophy, who needs it? She has a view that everyone needs philosophy. And there's no escape from having a philosophic uh, view or views in, in various forms. The question she puts is, do you choose them consciously? Are they consistent with each other? And are you really questioning them? Or are you, by contrast, just letting things float into your mind over time, absorbing views and acting in a way that you're not fully in control of your life. You're being guided by ideas that you have not really chosen. So Rand places value on philosophy and she herself is a philosopher. And here, you know, I think it's important to recognize that there are some philosophers that she had tremendous admiration for. And her work, in a sense, grows out of a certain tradition. She was highly respectful of Aristotle and the Aristotelian tradition. But as philosophy moves into the 20th century, the quality of the philosophical ideas that are under discussion really deteriorates. I think part of her analysis of why philosophy is so important is that she sees it as a force in the world, as a power in human life. When you have good ideas, and she thinks America is the climax of a tradition of valuable philosophic ideas, when you have good ideas, that brings you freedom. It brings you progress. When you have bad ideas or philosophy that's detached from the world and from life, that's part of her critique of some of the 20th century's thinkers. You get into trouble. 
And that's part of what she's talking about when she's analyzing contemporary events. She's saying this is the playing out of progressive ideas, which comes from a certain tradition, which she's critical of. Here, this is an offshoot of another view in contemporary philosophy, which again, she's critical of. So because of her view of contemporary philosophy, Ayn Rand actually has sympathy when she hears how people today react when they hear the term philosophy. Most people think, and she understands why this is the case, most people think philosophy has nothing to do with me. Yes, she thinks part of that is the responsibility of philosophers active at that time who've given the discipline a, a tarnished reputation. They don't have anything to offer that's of use to the lay reader. But the fact is that in order to operate in life, in order to live life, there are ideas that guide us, implicitly or explicitly. And to that extent, every person does have a philosophy. So her answer is every person does need philosophy, and it's, it is a matter of life or death. And I think part of the evidence that people rely on or, or bring into th their thoughts, philosophic views, and act on them, actually. Think of some of the catchphrases we hear all the time. Even some of us have used them. It's true for you. It's not true for me. Who can be certain? Nobody. Mm -hmm. Or it's just human nature. What can you do? Right. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Now, Rand actually talks about these examples in that title essay, Philosophy Who Needs It. And her view is, and what she explains is, that those in and of themselves are statements that, that stand on philosophy. Those are, those are conclusions that come from certain ideas and a certain view of life and a certain view of man. So even right there, those abstract kind of statements and conclusions that people are using are an expression of philosophy. Yeah, they're, they're using philosophy, but not realizing it. And she puts the challenge to everyone reading it is, it's your life. It matters. Choose correctly. Choose wisely. I, pick ideas that you believe will lead you to success. So following that lead essay, we have a, a number of articles where Rand is taking this idea that philosophy is inescapable and essential. And she shows us that in a number of different instances. So no matter what field we're looking at, philosophy actually interplays with it and underlies it. So let's talk about some of the other essays to give people a sense of what that relationship is. Sure. Take uh, egalitarianism and inflation. Now, at the time she was writing, inflation was a, a severe problem, and who knows, it might be coming back. At the time, what she brought to light is that in light of those kinds of economic problems that were racking the country, it was philosophy going unseen and unidentified that was really a, a major driving force behind that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, another essay where Rand looks at it from, you know, from the perspective of the educational establishment, uh, the stimulus and the response. Now, anyone who's taken psychology at the university level is familiar with B.F. Skinner and the stimulus and the response theory. When you step back and you actually look at what B.F. Skinner is saying, Rand says, that's just plain outrageous. It's just ridiculous. Now, how is it that an idea like that can actually become the prominent view in a field? So what she traces is how that happens, how it is that philosophy makes possible the rise of a view like B.F. Skinner's within a field like psychology. Yeah, or take uh, an open letter to Boris Spassky. Now, I, I assume a lot of people don't know his name. He was a chess player from the Soviet Union. And the thrust of her article is, look at the role of chess in the Soviet system and how popular it is, and, and the fact that so many bright people go to chess uh, in that system. And there's a, there's a profound point behind that, which is when you live in that kind of dictatorial society, chess becomes a kind of escape for the mind, the active type mentality, and that this is a consequence of philosophic ideas put into practice in a social system like communism, mm -hmm. or the Soviet one particularly. Right. So Rand's point is that philosophy actually enters every area of life, and she can help show how what that connection is and what, what, you know, how it plays out. Now, there's this particular case that she addresses that I think is worth pausing on. And that case is America. So there's an article at the end of the collection called Don't Let It Go. Now, what is Rand talking about here? For Rand, America is a great philosophical achievement. And America is actually something that she spends a fair bit of time in her writing, highlighting and really praising its, its virtues. Uh, so America is a philosophical achievement for Rand. And it has a certain cultural sense of life. And the essay explains what she means by a, a sense of life. 
But a sense of life in and of itself is not enough to carry a culture and to maintain a philosophic achievement. Right. And, and what she's identifying is that America was a, an, a, a once in a human history kind of event where philosophic ideas were brought to the fore by the founding fathers and their work in political science and political philosophy. And that we've been writing on that for a long time, and that's influenced the way Americans live and think. But it's at a level, so they have a certain philosophic view, but it's at a level that's not explicit, mm -hmm. and that it's very unstable and vulnerable to the influence of outside influences. And her, the thrust of a lot of her critique of American culture is that it is being undermined by an alien philosophic outlook, right. foreign, anti-American in certain ways, uh, moral view, political view, and that's sort of the encapsulates the thrust of a lot of what she's doing here in terms of showing the role of philosophy, both positive in America's founding, but also negative in how it's influencing our society. And unless, unless those ideas become explicitly identified and explicitly rooted out, that whole sense of life, that philosoph philosophical achievement will be undone. It will be let go. And so this is a call, a call to action from Rand to actually look at those ideas and to make sure that we don't let it go. Well, it seems as though we barely scratched the surface here with Rand's writings because she has so many essays on so many different topics and newspaper columns and other articles that one could look at. Uh, for instance, one of my personal favorites is an article about Marilyn Monroe. Now, why would Rand write about Marilyn Monroe? It's because she thought that Monroe was treated very unjustly for what she was projecting on screen, and that said something about the culture that she wanted to comment on. And so she came, comes to the defense of Marilyn Monroe. And I, I, I wish we'd had time to talk about Ayn Rand's writings about the Apollo mission, the, the achievement that it represented, and the, the way in which man's reason was vindicated and its power to essentially reach to the stars was shown in so, such a dramatic form. Uh, and the range of writings that Ayn Rand produced is, is enormous and, and it's in itself fascinating. As an ardent atheist, she loved Christmas. She wrote explaining why she did. She celebrated it. Or in education, she was a, a staunch opponent of the progressive movement, which took over education in America to a large extent. And she saw the damage that that did to the mind, which in her estimation was so important in life. And she was ardently a proponent for an alternative, the, the Montessori method, which she believed was a way to foster the mind of children. And so if you, if you visit Ayn Rand's works and you explore them, there's just so much there to, to appreciate and, and learn from. Well, we've come to the end of our conversation today. I wish we had had more time to cover Ayn Rand's works. There's just so much more than we have space for. For instance, Ayn Rand wrote a collection called Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, where she lays out her theory of knowledge. She also published her own periodicals, The Objectivist, The Objectivist Newsletter, The Ayn Rand Letter. In them, she wrote on practically every major issue of the day, drawing out timeless lessons. In addition, there are publications that show us the interesting responses she gave to questions that readers sent in, along with information about the events she spoke at. It gives us a sense of what happened during the period where she was an active speaker and writer. And after Ayn Rand passed away, there was a string of books based on her own development. For example, a collection of excerpts from her journals. We can learn about the creation of Atlas Shrugged and how Ayn Rand's unique characters came into shape. We can also read a collection of her letters, and that's fascinating because we see her engaged with other intellectuals of her time, with politicians such as Barry Goldwater, philosophers, and fans. Ayn Rand very patiently answers questions from all of these people, and it really gives us an insight into what kind of person she was. There are other books that really give us a sense of Ayn Rand as a thinker. One example is a book called Ayn Rand Answers. It's a collection of her responses to questions from audiences. Because they are live responses, one gets a sense of how quick she was to integrate the information that she needed. These additional materials reveal the personal and intellectual Ayn Rand in a way that the articles we talked about just hint at. Finally, for anyone who likes the fiction, the early Ayn Rand includes some shorter items, 
and they're collected in one place there. Two books that came out in the last few years give us a sense of Ayn Rand's views on how to write fiction and nonfiction. It's fascinating to see her reveal her thinking processes, both about how to communicate her radical philosophic ideas and how she views writing fiction from her own distinctive outlook. The book about fiction is called The Art of Fiction. In it, she provides us with the questions she asked herself when developing the characters that we talked about. We get a sense of how she developed them and what her purpose was in creating them. I think all of this just underlines, so there's a lot here to explore. And much of what we've covered will be intriguing to people. I encourage them to explore those works that we've covered and the ones we haven't had time for. Within this section, you will see that there are some more to explore items. We've gathered some information to give you a sense of where you might want to go next. Also, here at the Ayn Rand Institute in Irvine, there's a range of courses on topics we've been talking about. We encourage you to explore them. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining us.